Okay, before we actually uh, go over some theory stuff today, I want to talk about what I have done with Blackboard that might have been slightly different than the last time you visited it. Uh, you'll notice that you have some tasks being posted, like the lab file management, which should have automatically disappeared because it was due, what, yesterday or the day before that. Uh, then underneath that, your lab word assignment. Uh, I told you guys, get used to going to Blackboard daily. Uh, I will do my best to post these assignments here to let you know that, hey, this word assignment is actually in my IT lab, and go there. And when you click on that task, let me do so, it should tell you something like, to accomplish this week's lab, please visit that. It'll also tell you, use Internet Explorer. Remember, the only way you get into my IT lab is through Internet Explorer. The thing that I also added to Blackboard this week, maybe a little bit at the end of last week, I have the link called Using My IT Lab. It's going to a YouTube series of videos on how to access the training videos through my IT lab, how to access the actual lab itself, and how to upload the assignment when you get done doing it. All right? So if you guys are having problems using my IT lab, uh, go ahead and watch that video. The other thing I did that was different from last year is I created this folder called Q&A. From time to time, students will send me an email or see me after class, ask me a question when they're working on the lab. Um, I didn't know how to move that arrow, or I didn't know how to insert text from a file. Um, and these might have been part of the first lab, Lab Board Part 1. And so I'll create a quick two-minute video illustrating how to do that. However, as I said in this week's announcement, um, don't simply shoot me an email. The first thing you should be doing is going through the trainer. Everything that's in that lab is going to be in that week's training exercise. They are getting better with it. They just did a big update this past winter through my IT lab to add more stuff in the training simulations to accomplish these labs. Okay? So this inserting text from a file, that wasn't in last year's my IT lab training thing but as part of the lab. This year it's actually there. It's like the second or third task that you do in your training when it comes to uh, the simulation, okay? But students sent me an email the other day and I said, sure, no problem, it'll take me two minutes to record that video on how to insert a text file. So if you guys are working on the lab, always try to work on them in advance. Lab two is due, what, next Tuesday? Start working on that. When you get across one of the steps and you're not sure how to accomplish that, tell me that it was lab word part two, step number five. I can go get that step, see what it's like, and if I see if it's not in the training thing or I haven't posted a video already, I'll make you a video. So once again, that's going to be under the content folder and the Q&A folder. You guys have any questions? So hopefully we're getting used to Blackboard and you guys are warming up to My IT Lab. Uh, if you haven't registered for My IT Lab, be sure to do so. I think last week I had two students that said I didn't have the course ID. If you haven't gotten that yet, just come and see me and I'll uh, make sure you're enrolled. All right, so let's step back go over what we did on uh, Tuesday's class and then we'll lead into what's going to be happening today. Uh, in Tuesday's class we created an index card and I had you guys basically write your name vertically, the first four letters that make up your first name. I made a big point to make a difference between the first letter being capitalized and the rest of the letters being lowercase. And then after that you guys used a particular table, if you will, a reference. What was the name of that table that would convert these letters to a number, which we use decimal? Anybody remember that table? It's on Blackboard. ASCII. And ASCII said that we are going to use 8 bits, extended ASCII I should say. We're going to use 8 bits to represent one letter. And so what they did was they actually mapped it out accordingly. Uh, A starting at 65, remember correctly? 
and then going all the way up to the capital letter Z, then lowercase a going all the way down to lowercase z. You good about that? Uh, anybody have that table up by chance, week three? If not, I can get it up. So, um, I just want to make sure that I'm referencing this correctly. There's my chart. And so the capital letter N is 78. And how did I take that 78 and convert it into binary? What was one of the methods that I used? Divided by 2, so the division method. The division method took up a lot of space, but it was pretty simple. I took the 78 divided by 2, and I ended up with what? 39 remainder 0. What was the next thing I did after I took that 78 divided by 2? Took the 39 divided by 2. So I keep on taking what? The quotient and keep on dividing it by 2. So what do I have here? 19 remainder 1. Remember I was telling you in class, I said if it's an even number, you'll always have a zero for a remainder. If it's an odd number, you'll always have a one for a remainder. So it's a nice way to check your work. So I'm going to take this 19 divided by 2, and I'm going to keep on doing this. When do I stop? When what is zero? When the quotient when the quotient becomes zero, okay, so let's try that. And then we have one for the remainder. But if I count these up, I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that worked out just fine in the 80s. Remember, back then space was very limited. Transistors were big, so it couldn't fit that many in a chip. We'll talk about what a transistor is at the end of this class. So we had to make sacrifices. In fact, the last letter in my name wouldn't have been able to have been typed. So we had to extend ASCII one more bit. It's really interesting. When you only have seven bits, you can represent 128 unique symbols. That is, two raised to the number of bits gives you the different combinations. Two raised to seven gives me 128. By adding one more bit, I double the power, if you will. I double the unique number of symbols I can represent. One more bit. So I would take this one more time, divide the zero so that I get zero, 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 and that gives me my eighth magical bit. Okay. This is what we call extended ASCII. Now I start down at the bottom, and then I glue these up together, starting from top, oh, sorry, from bottom to top. So the letter N, capital letter N, looks like this. Now this is what's really cool about something. You guys asked or was puzzled, why did the letter A start at 65 and not 1 or 0. And I said, well, probably because what would you make 0? What would you make 1? What would you make 2? And that made sense. And then the question would become, why didn't A start at 10? Well, let's take a look at this. Notice that this is capitalized, and it's 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, right? Maybe I threw an extra 1 in there. Now let me take a look at my lowercase i and see that this is 105. So what I want to do is take that 105 and convert it into binary. And what do I get here? 52 remainder 1. And I'm going to keep on doing this. Remember, this is a very long way of doing it. And I deliberately did this because it's going to lead to today's lecture. So we, what do we have here? Uh, 26. Remainder one, oh, remainder zero. Thirteen, remainder zero. Uh, 
Also, I did this correct. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's write them out. I have a zero, a one, a one, a zero, a one, a zero, a zero, a one. All of my lowercase letters will have a zero right here. I mean a one. Sorry, a one. All of my uppercase letters will only have a one right here. They spaced it out because they saw this in binary and they made it really simple and trivial to say, okay, one here is going to be a capital letter, a one one is going to be a lowercase letter. Hence the shift key. Do you notice your keyboard doesn't have 52 letters? Just 26, all capitalized, correct? But when you naturally type them in, they're lowercase. And if you want to make them larger, you hold the shift key. All the shift key is doing is turning this bit off. And that's what we're trying to get to. These bits are symbols that are used to represent electricity, magnets, light, possibly even sound. We're using physical properties, things that we can touch to represent things that really don't exist. The letter N is something that we have made. You can't grow it in a garden, okay folks? It's not natural, if you will. It's a concept. And we took this concept using something that is physical to represent it. That's what we call digital processing. And remember what the three acronyms, the three letters are that define a computer. Input, process, output. Data comes in, what comes out? Information. And that's how we define a computer. Using this general concept of taking letters, converting them to numbers, we were able to build onto this. And the next thing we were able to digitize was sound. And take a look at the evolution of computers. Take a look at the evolution of entertainment. First biggest thing when it came to computers was, and these computers were huge, they'd be the size of buildings. They can process letters. They could type. They already had a mechanical device that could type for them. We called it the typewriter. What made this thing the size of a building so fancy and wonderful? And by the way, we use these little index cards where had to punch holes in them. So fascinating. Why did we build these things that cost a lot of money to do something we already had done like a typewriter? What was the key advantage that this new digital piece of equipment could do, this computer, would have over a typewriter? You could store it, make some changes to it, and reprint it. Because this is easy to reproduce. Not for us. If I asked you guys to write this out, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. After the first 0, 1, 1, 0, you guys are going to be like, could you slow down and say it again? That's that whole being unnatural to us. But a computer is just seeing volts, lights, on, off, on, off. So then after we started mastering this, and this concept of making it smaller, moving away from these big vacuum tubes, these mechanical switches, to something that Bell created called the transistor. And the transistor radio came out in the 60s. It was a big thing. So big, it's like what your smartphone is to you today. What is a smartphone and how does it equate to a transistor radio? It's a personal computer that goes with you everywhere you're at. 
It's small enough to fit in your pocket, and the battery can last a very long time. And what you can do on your computer that takes up a whole desk, you can do that takes up just a pocket. And that's what the transistor radio was about. Do you mean I can take this on the road with me and power it with a little battery? So we started digitizing sound. Because by having smaller transistors, we can fit more of them. By fitting more of them in whatever, we can represent more. Letters were easy to represent because they didn't require that much. Sound required more. Because the human ear can hear a lot of different frequencies, a lot of unique different frequencies, right? I think it's like 10,000 frequencies. So we ask ourselves, two raised to what power is going to be able to give us enough bits so that when you listen to it, it sounds pretty good. And then along came the music CD. Replacing what? Tapes. And how does the music CD work? You'll see that next week when we get into storage devices. Same principle, though, zeros and ones. After we started digitizing music, we went into digitizing video. How many bits did I tell you guys in the last class were going to be required to represent one dot of color? 24 bits per one dot of color. So if I were to represent a photo, that's one megapixel, uh, MB, mega pixel. We stole this unit from the scientific community. They're usually called SI units, if I remember correctly. Mega is typically referred to as a, oops, million. Tell me, what's the difference between a, out, sorry, a gallon, a quart, a pint, and an ounce? A mile, a yard, a foot, an inch. They measure the same. A mile, a yard, a foot, and an inch measures distance, correct? A gallon, a quart, a pint, an ounce measures, let's say, fluids. I know you can use them to measure, you know, cereals and whatever, but let's just say they're fluid ounces. We good about that? So why do we have gallons? Isn't that just an extra thing to memorize? Why don't we just say, what, 128 fluid ounces? Why do we say... Four quarts, which we wouldn't say four quarts. Four quarts would be a joke, right? Why do you say, give me a $50 bill versus 50 ones? Easier to use so you can represent larger quantities, right? Likewise, a pixel is just a byte, but there is a coefficient to it, if you will. One pixel... equals three bytes. Where did that three come from? Remember what a pixel is. It's a dot of color. How many colors do we need to make any color that we can see? In other words, how many primary colors are there? Three. So each byte represents a color. Whoops. Oh, uh, red, green, and blue, right? And this is why when you're shopping and you're looking at a monitor, or you're looking at computer specs, it'll say RGB. This is where the RGB is coming from. 
It means your monitor understands the three, sh uh, the three primary colors. Now I know in art class they probably taught you about yellow as being the primary color. Uh, in fact, how do you make green? Blue and yellow, that's right. So what have they decided to do? They try to optimize that and they said, well, green has some yellow built into it, if you will. We're just utilizing that bits. So we said red, green, and blue, and then the eye's funny about yellows. If I try to place it like a whole shades of yellows on there, the human eye can't detect as many yellow shades as they can with like red shades, green shades, and blue shades. It's a goofy thing, but it happens. In fact, another thing that's another interesting point, people that are colorblind, what deficiency, what shades do they have a problem seeing? And, and you have to call the Department of Transportation and say, what the hell were you thinking about when you made traffic lights red, yellow, and green? Right? They're thinking, well, those are three primary colors. So here, uh, we just optimized it. We said red, green, and blue, one byte for each. So that means... When you take a one megapixel camera or photo, you have literally three million bytes. That is really the point about this. One megapixel equals three megabytes. We are assuming uncompressed photos, right? not stored as a JPEG, but rather as a bitmap, BMP. We all right with that? That means in order for me to represent this photo, I need how many bits, how many zeros and ones are gonna be made or used to store this picture? Well, a byte is equal to how many bits? And now we know why. See, it's not like an English class, it's not like a business class that tells you to make more hot dog rolls than there are hot dogs, right? Or the opposite. Uh, there's a scientific approach to this. Scientists are very efficient, especially computer people. And one of the most anal people you guys will ever know. Things either have to be a zero or a one. There is no gray. There is no maybe. I mean, after all, ask your mom if you want to stay over at a friend's house and she says, well, go see your dad. And your dad says, well, go see your mom. And so you go bother your mom, and your mom says, maybe. What the hell's a maybe? Teach your kids that maybes are no's. Because if they do it anyway, you're going to yell at them, correct? Because you meant to say no, but you just wanted to let them off easier. So to me, a maybe is a softer way of saying no without having to say no. Let them try it. And if you're upset with them, you can be like, I never said yes. And that's the way computer people are. It's either yes or no, there's no maybe. You're gonna fall one way or the other. There's no shades of gray in this matter. So when I have eight bits, there's a reason why we made one byte eight bits. Because what is the smallest piece of data that we care about? letters. That's it. And then we advanced it. And think about the way I teach. I'll write things out on the board. I will use sound and I use video. Which one requires more pieces of data? Which one's easier for you guys to learn from? Reading or watching? Getting the idea? So, eight bits, one byte, that's what we said this becomes our minimum standard. From here on out, we use bytes. We say that three bytes represents one color. That means if I multiply this three by this eight, I will need 24 million bits. Do you see that a lowercase to be and not upper case? Now, if this was on a paycheck, which one would you like to see? This one or that one? The one of the same. 
If I tell you to go to the store and buy four quarts of milk, then you come back with one gallon. Should I be pissed off at you? I was expecting four containers, and you came back with one container. Just one bigger container, correct? These are one of the same. But you know what? You marketing people, kudos to you guys. Especially if you work for internet service providers. They will not market three megabytes per second. Because three looks like a smaller number than this number right here. They'll market 24 megabits per second. In fact, look at Time Warner's packages. 24 megabits per second? You're thinking, well, hell, I can download a song in less than a second. Well, if an average song is five megabytes, it'll take you a little bit more than a second. Don't get the capital B mixed up with the lowercase b. Byte bits. Get it? And that's all because you marketing people out there that we had to care about this. And I, like I said, you got to give that person some credit because they understood bytes and bits and said, marketing perspective, 24 looks sexier than 3. Right? You guys do this. I know it. All right. So what am I saying now? Now that I was able to convert this to bits, I'm saying that I need 24 million elements, 24 million switches, which we call a transistor, 24 million little tiny magnets. Let's talk about transistors for a second, because that's going to be the heart of our processor and our memory. How does a transistor work? Transistors are made up of what we call semiconductors. And I love that word, semiconductors. I'll have videos posted this weekend just giving you some animations of what a semiconductor and how it behaves. But for a second, could you guys just imagine water flowing through pipes? And when you turn on a faucet, the water's moving and the water comes out of the faucet, correct? And when you turn it off, it stops coming out and there's no water, right? So in the essence, we're getting this Water is either coming out or it's not coming out, correct? You see that discrete nature? It's like I could use boys and girls. I can use the fact that you can sit or stand. So I say to myself, all right, um, what does a semiconductor do? What does a transistor do? Well, a semiconductor will like freeze the pipe, hence stopping the water from flowing, stopping the electricity from moving. And if the electricity isn't moving, we say it's zero. And then it'll thaw the pipe out, allowing the electricity to flow, giving you a one. And we can do this. We can say, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it off, turn it on, turn it on, turn it on, turn it off. And the string comes out. And we can do that so fast that when you hit that letter on your keyboard, it shows up on your screen. When you guys had to get that letter to show up, it might have taken you five minutes to divide that all up, correct? Computer doesn't have to do the division. They know what switches to turn on and off, but they had to turn them on. And so what's going on with the computer? Watch your eyes. Anybody have seizures? Well, we're going to find out. And so what will happen is it'll say on, or sorry, off in this case, on, off, oh, wait a minute. How many zeros do you guys know? How would you know whether this is a zero, 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 or just one long zero to a one? What are you going to need to know that things have changed, but and you should indicate that? What would have helped you guys to know that that was two zeros? Say it, come on, what is this? Yeah, clock! 
And one of the things you're going to do when you go shopping for computers, call the clock speed. Have you seen this? The gigahertz, like the 2.4 gigahertz or the 3 gigahertz when you go shopping for a computer, you will be seeing it next week when we do our little shopping exercise. This measures how fast a computer can finish a cycle. The faster the clock is, the more zeros and ones can fit in a second, correct? The more zeros and ones you can fit in a second, the quicker it can be processed. This is why this is the chief factor when you buy a computer. The num I'm sorry, the number of cycles or the speed, the gigahertz, if you will. All right? How fast can we turn those switches on and off, if you will? Now that's just processing the data, turning it into information. What about storing the data? With one switch, I can represent two things, right? Lights being on or lights being off. That means I can say, switch on letter A, switch off letter B. That's it. How do I represent C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and so on? Make more switches. Now if I had two switches, by the way, I would use this other switch that you see in front of this classroom, but that turns the lights on in the other room, and that pisses those students off. So you would never know if I'm turning those lights on or off, all right? So if I just put this way over there, we'll put it right above that. Now I have two switches. Two raised to the power of two gives me four unique states. And that would be like me splitting this half, this classroom in half. The back lights can be turned on and off, and the front lights can be turned on and off. We good about that? So instead of using switches, I'm going to use people. I see Morgan's about to fall asleep, and we're going to use Brittany. All right? So I have two people here. Right now, they're both sitting down. Zero, zero. If I want to represent the letter A, I'll say, okay, A is going to be two people sitting down. Letter B, Morgan, stand up. Zero, one, right? Letter C, Morgan, sit down. Brittany, stand up. Oh, I love this. I feel like God now. I like this puppet. All right. So there's what? We said that was C, right? All right. And then D would be? Wonderful. That was four letters, right, folks? But I can only represent one letter at a time. Do you see that? But there's only four letters. Can I spell anything with that? Let's see. A, B, C, and D. I can spell cab. All right. So let's take you guys and slide you over here. And uh, let's see, C is going to be what? Uh, we said you were both, C was you standing, you sitting. So you stand, you sit. I love this. All right. I got a little sister and she's pretty bossy. She would love this exercise. All right. This is the letter C. I can't do anything with them. I want to make a ward here. So guess what I'm going to do? Hello, folks. And that's why I had them move over because you guys are here. All right. Now, it's going to be the letter A, so C-A, so you're going to... No, you both sit down, right? You both are good. Look at that. You guys got lucky. All right, now we're doing what? The B? So you have to stand, and that's it. But I only have four letters. That's pretty bad, right? So we're going to get a third person in on this. With three people, I can represent eight letters, correct? Now, with eight letters, I think I would have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, right? Eight. Can we spell anything with that? Can't spell dog. Uh, what, heck? Ah, uh, I got some creative students. All right. So, H. I don't want to have to go through all those and map them out, right? I know H is, we said this is 0, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. H is going to be all 1's. 
So, Morgan Rise, Kiana, I need you to come over here, join the group. You're the uh, third magical bit. Josh, you're going to be active too in a minute. Ah, sorry, suckers. You guys get to do some standing. All right, so the second row, I have four. A four is going to be a one here and a zero, zero. So what did we say? We said, I got to make sure I trans this. So this is going to be zero, zero. So yeah, we're going to have you sit down. Sit, sit, then a one. You're good. Josh, you're standing up. Good. All right. So now we have E. A is going to be zero. So Vanessa, yep, and Carl, slide over next to Jessica. All right. Now, gentlemen, do the lady a favor and come up front. All right. We need to see Wendy's here to help. See, got to teach these guys manners. Chivalry's dying. So here we go. D is going to be three, and three looks like this. No, three looks like this. And Wendy, you get to stand, and you guys get to, no, I'm sorry, you get to sit, and you guys get to stand. And just like that, we spell the head by using people, whether they're standing or sitting. And when you take a look at this from a bird's eye view, you, all you're just measuring is, like, the more people I have, the more I can hold. And you know what? That's the limitation of this classroom. This is it. All I can do is handle four letters going from A to H. If I want to handle more choices, but I only have so much space, I won't be able to represent a bigger word. You see what I'm saying? So if I wanted to go from A to Z, I would only probably have like one letter choice because I have 15 students here, right? And I need eight students to represent one letter in ASCII. Does that make sense, guys? So you're becoming transistors. All right, everybody can return back to their seats. They can sit down, just wake you up. It's a morning class and it sort of helps. It makes us say that we want more bits more bits gives us more power. In fact, there was this guy in Intel, one of the co-founders, that said every two years, processing power will double. In fact, he said every 18 months, processing power will double. The guy's name, and you'll have to get to know him, is called Gordon Moore. And his law was known as Moore's Law. And this is what has made... Intel successful for the last 40 years, 40, 50 years now, I think they were made in the 70s, is that Intel drives, as with any semiconducting company, to make the transistor smaller. By making the transistor smaller, they can add more to them to the point where you can add billions of transistors to something the size of my thumbnail. To me, that's fascinating. Because I know with more transistors comes more power. That's why our computers can do more. That's why we're able to watch high-definition movies. That's why our video games are becoming more realistic. But you don't go shopping for a computer counting the number of transistors. You do, however, go shopping for a computer, looking at megabytes. And that megabytes comes up in many different areas. In fact, we've gotten these bytes so much that we moved from mega to giga. And that's what I want to make sure before I leave today that you understand these units, these SI units of measurements. You now know what a byte is. You now know what a transistor is. It's a physical element that acts like a switch that represents a single bit, correct? So when you start seeing another byte, you are seeing a million bit bits. Sorry, sorry, a megabyte would be 8 million bits. That's like 8 million of you guys being up or down. So, what exactly it's a storage. We start off the first one being a byte. And we said a byte equals 8 bits. What's the difference between a byte? 
get those two mixed up because they're both all units of storage. I think it's a terabyte when it comes to a trillion and then I think Tetra comes down later down the line. Yeah, it's pretty pathetic, but you see I'm just adding three zeros, you know, just to add to the next comma, if you will. Bet your ass I'm looking for gas mileage because I live about 40, 40 miles away. So that's 90 miles a day I put in there. And when I first started working at Corning, I was driving this SUV that got like 15 miles per gallon. I got rid of that damn thing in a heartbeat. <laughs> and the money that I saved in gas was able for me to buy a car that got 32, 33 miles per gallon. And I was happy. I didn't care what it looked like. I didn't care whether it had bucket leather seats, heated seats, air conditioning. All I was looking at was the miles per gallon. Correct? 
you guys might be looking at other things. Nowadays, we're looking at cars and technology. I want to be able to integrate my phone with it so I can listen to Pandora or whatever. But you know this because of experience. Utilizing it, there's a long history when it comes to automobiles. And when you go past the gas pump, you know, the more efficient your vehicle is, the more it saves you in the wallet. Same principle holds true when you go shopping for a computer. We want to try to buy the most efficient, bang for the buck, if you will, computer. Do you buy the $10,000 computer, the $5,000 computer, or the $500 computer? How do you know that this computer here that's $500 is better than that computer over there that's $800? What are the things you look for? First factor, I've already said, clock speed. There's going to be units associated with this. You didn't tell me fuel efficiency. You told me MPGs, right? That's like a unit to fuel efficiency. But we don't like to use MPGs anymore because now that we have these electric cars, they don't use gallons, right? So we're going to be hearing something called more and more fuel efficiency. How more fuel effective is this vehicle over that one? And then we're going to create a new scale that sort of standardizes the system. So when you buy gas, diesel, electric, whatever, it's the same number applied, correct? That unit for clock speed is called Hertz. You just found out that here's your standards. A kilo is just a capital K. A mega, capital M. A giga, capital G. And a Terra, capital T. So when you see gigahertz, it's going to be G H Z. Hertz is a cycle, okay? Just like a frequency. It occurs. We'll explore what a cycle is, hopefully by the end of class. Question is, which computer is faster? This is the marketing people. Because if I was doing this and I wanted to clear the inventory, I might say that this thing that's a thousand megahertz, I'm going to sell you for a thousand dollars. And this thing that's a gigahertz, I'll sell it to you for six hundred dollars. Now you're thinking that if something costs more, it must be better. And you're also thinking, Something with more zeros must also mean that it too is better. This is the reason why your little access code from my IT lab came with a textbook. It looks like you're getting something more for your money, right? Are you getting something more for your money if this is the way it is? No, Jessica's back there shaking her head no. All right, Jessica, why is that? You're right here. How many more zeros does this have over that? Three, right? So if I were to tack these three zeros over to here, would they now be the, say, the same? Do you see how when I go from the smaller number to the larger number, I have to tack on zeros to get them to equate? So be very careful of this. I've seen this done many, many times. I guess you can say this is like the highway mile per gallon, and this is like the city's mile per gallon. It's just the highway is usually a bigger number, right? A better number? Be careful. If you live in Corning and that's all you drive, don't ever look at the highway miles thing. So equate this. Learn that scale so that you can now compare accurately. What's the next factor? Memory. I always say memory is like the poor man's 
performance upgrade. If you feel your computer is going slow and you feel you have to buy a new computer, stop. Go online, buy a $20 stick of memory, and you'll see your performance double in, uh, double in speed. Why is that? You saw in today's class, I had to use you. I had to use seats. You had to be manipulated, correct? A lot was going on. Just like in the index card, a lot was going on. When it comes to memory, the units is going to be bytes. Whether it's megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes. I wish for that day to come. Right now we're in the gigabyte range. So you saw in class that I needed space. I needed containers. My containers, if you will, were the seats, correct? Not all the seats were used. But they were there for me to hold you, to store you while I was manipulating you going up and down. Now when I'm done with you guys, I'm going to throw you back in my closet. That's permanent storage. I need to get you out of my class so the next class can come in. Correct? Now obviously you're not going to go in the closet. You're just going to leave the classroom and you're going to go out in the hallway. But I don't care. You're out of my room. Which means other students can come in and be manipulated be processed, correct? You guys are processing now. I am manipulating. It's funny, you guys paid me to manipulate you. I got a great job. But what's happening? First, we have this CPU, which has this as a factor, but there's other things. Then we have this other component called memory. And then we have this other component called storage. Whether it's your hard drive, a CD, a flash drive, whatever. And I said to you that what defines a computer is the IPO, right? By the way, square, circle, I'll be cute. Make that a triangle. Not that it's what it is, but just we can just quickly reference them. What were these three elements? These make up the P part of the IPL, correct? You needed all three of these to have the processing component. Why is that? This classroom is, I love it. It's my favorite classroom on campus. It's quaint, smaller. You guys are closer to me. I have two whiteboards. It's my room, okay? The fact that it's small and you guys are closer to me means I can be a better, effective instructor. Why? I like can gauge your look. I can see that you guys are out there screwing around on the internet. I've been a little bit patient about that, but eventually I'll be cutting down on it. I also know that when I talk, it's effective. And if I quickly walk over to that other whiteboard, I can see things. This relationship between me and you, if you will, or me in this classroom, is perfect analogy of what goes on between the CPU and the memory. The CPU controls what's going on in the computer, but it can't hold everything that needs to be processed. A better relationship between me and you would be in my office. It's even more intimate. You feel a little bit less embarrassed, if you will, because you don't have your fellow students near you. So when you ask a question, it's just between you and me. But my office isn't that big. I can't put you all into my office. So we meet Tuesday, Thursday in this classroom. That's the key thing, though. We have to meet in this classroom. In order for you guys to learn, you have to be here. In order for you to be processed, you have to be here. Then what is this? Consider this your home. I won't enter in your house to give you guys a private lesson. You need to come to me. Actually, 
We both need to go to the class. You good about that? Because I don't want you to come to my house as much as you don't want me to come to your house. You good there? So we meet, we meet here. This is known as the workspace. This is where learning is being conducted. This is where data is being processed. Well, I shouldn't say processed. Being waiting, waiting to be processed. There it is. So you guys need to come into this classroom. No different than whatever's stored in the hard drive needs to come up in memory. But I, too, also need to be in that, right? So you guys are those zeros and ones waiting to be manipulated into information, correct? I am the instructions, the knowledge that I want to give to you. That happens in the classroom, happens into memory. So how effective do you think I would be as an instructor? And how much money could I save this school if this classroom didn't have that blue wall in the back? I take that blue wall down. You know, this is one of those dividing walls. What would happen to the space of my classroom or memory? Double, right, in essence? Which means I can allow more students in here. And by having more students in here, I should be able to get a lot more done. I can educate more people at the same time. Why don't I just come down here? Well, it would take me a longer time to go to each person's house to try to conduct my business, correct? Memory is physically close to the CPU. It's faster than here. See, anybody have a whiteboard at their house? Oh, Jessica's shaking her head. Yes, yeah, she does. You do? Interesting. <laughs> is it as big as my whiteboard here? Okay. <laughs> I could be a better effective teacher at Jessica's house because she has a whiteboard than at your house, right? So memory is faster than your storage device, physically closer to you, so data can be passed back and forth between these two components, which we give it a special name. Back in the day, it used to be called the front side bus. We'll talk about that later. But this is the key here. The more I have of this, the less I have to come down here. In fact, the analogy is the more classrooms I have, right, or the bigger my classroom, the less classes I have to have. So if I had five sections of this course, and we sat in one large auditorium. It took only one hour and a half out of my day. Whereas if I had a smaller classroom, I'd have to do that five times, which means it would take me seven hours. Do you see why buying more of this can help your computer run faster? By having more of this, you can have more applications on your screen more web browsers, you can listen to music, watch a movie, do your word paper, and whatever the case may be. Because you have more room to hold all those zeros and ones, correct? Because as we found out today, it doesn't matter if it's application, a text file, a picture, music, or video. How are they all being represented? By zero or by a one, correct? And that's why memory is stored as bytes, or represented by bytes, correct? The larger your memory, the more bytes. However, the bytes per dollar, remember that whole cost efficiency I was telling you guys about? Are the dollars per bytes, bytes per dollar, how does that work out? Dollars per bytes. This is gonna cost more dollars per bytes than this. The third leg does contribute to storage, I'm sorry, to your system's performance. Ah, 
yes, your storage is going to be measured in bytes. However, it's not the only unit. There's going to be other units that's going to be playing a big, important role. In fact, today, you'll be hard-pressed to find a hard drive that's not large enough to handle your needs. Back in the day, it was always difficult. In fact, you always had to make multiple backup copies and use floppies to take files off your hard drive to add other files in there. Today, we've gotten terabytes and terabytes of storage out of things the size of my palm. What we're trying to move on is not the whole size of the container, but rather how fast the data transfers from here to there. And that's what we call the transfer rate. Rate, when you guys think of rate, what's involved? Yeah, it's speed, it's time, right? Speed is how many feet, miles, meters you can go per second, per time. So rate is something per time, all right? What do you think this something's going to be for storage? And typically it's going to be read as megabytes per second. All right? Obviously, the larger this number is, the faster your storage device is. Okay? Because its goal is to take this and put it up in here. Why do we want to take the storage and put it up in here? Because this too also has a transfer rate. And it also is measured like in typically gigabits per second. Gigabits or gigabytes, you know, vary it. Different marketing techniques, but still the same units, right? It's bytes, bits per second. All right. We used to call this the front side bus. And that used to be one of the seven factors when you were shopping for a computer. You always wanted to make sure that the front side bus would be as fast as possible. And the front side bus actually used megahertz, not gigabits per second. Now, we don't need to understand why they did that. We just need to understand that, obviously, the higher the clock speed, if you will, the faster the transfer of data would be. In fact, it led to another thing. To get from this unit to this unit, we would multiply by something called the ward length. And by the way, that's factor number four. Let me go back to my analogy using cars and having horsepower. Horsepower is the muscle that can do what with the vehicle? Possibly make it go faster, but it could also do something else. Because when I was a kid, it was really a hard thing to understand. Buy a diesel vehicle, buy a diesel car, buy a diesel truck. And I'm like, well, they don't have the horsepowers that gas vehicles do. And what's the difference between diesel and gasoline? More torque. So now I'm scratching my head, and I had to understand how does horsepower and torque mix in? Because by the way, you guys are in the market for a new car. They're selling more about torque than they are about horsepower. Gasoline engines are getting more what we call direct injection. So they're able to get more torque out of the engine. And torque is what you guys love. It's not really the horsepower. You really don't care about the gigahertz as much as you care about how many bits per second can be transferred. If you're transferring a movie to your iPhone and it takes you an hour, that pisses you off. If it takes you a second, that makes you happy, right? And the unit that you're focusing on is this right here, gigabits per second. Well, torque when it comes to a car is that power that throws you into the back of your seat. 
It's the power that you feel. It's the power that's applied to your wheels. It's to get up and go. The more you weigh, the more torque you have, the less you'll notice. You can have 500 horsepower, like in a Corvette, and I promise you, you can't hook up your RV to it. It doesn't nearly have the torque needed to move the RV. Likewise here. This unit is extremely important. I always find it funny that people that live in big cities have Ferraris. I can tell you folks, they don't buy it for the horsepower. What a shame. Because if you would buy it for your needs, then go buy a lawnmower if you live in the city. People like us out in the country, we should be having the Ferraris. Light up on 17, go from 0 to 100, no time flat, you'll be an Elmira like you. I'm not encouraging this. <laughs> but I'm just saying, why if you live in the city, do you have a Ferrari when you go from one traffic light to the next one, to the next one, to the next one? It's just a measure of how fast you can get from traffic light to traffic light to traffic light. What a waste. Give me some of those ponies and I can put them to use. Right? So I asked my students, now that you know this, which is faster, a Ferrari or a Greyhound bus? You have three ways of answering that question. One, the Ferrari is faster than the Greyhound bus. Two, the Greyhound bus is faster than the Ferrari. Or three, it depends. How many people think a Ferrari is faster than a Greyhound bus? No takers? How many people think a Greyhound bus is faster than a Ferrari? Mitch is shake, all right, all right. And then obviously those who haven't raised their hand must say choice three because it's like the safe middle of the road. As my old speech instructor told me, when you stand in the middle of the road, you have the chance of getting hit by both sides. So I'll say this again. This time, pick a side. Ferrari over the bus, the bus over the Ferrari, and those are your only two choices. Ferrari over the bus. Right. I'll give you that one. Ferrari over the bus has more clock speed, has more horsepower, better acceleration, right? Now let me add to that, because you're right, the Ferrari is faster than the bus, assuming all other things are equal, right? But what does the bus offer that a Ferrari does not? And nobody goes shopping for a Greyhound bus unless you have a super large family, right? And this is why we're learning this stuff. Because why go out there and buy a large process that's going to cost you $1,000 just to brag to your friends? You get nothing for it, folks. You look like a fool driving a Greyhound bus just for yourself going to school. Same here. I would laugh at you if you told me you spent $3,000 on your computer and all you do is word processing. So, the bus obviously offers more seating capacity, correct? So now I have to throw this into the loop. The seating capacity would be like the bits. What would take this class to New York City faster? The Ferrari or the bus? Why? Less trips have to be taken between here and there. Correct? The Ferrari can do it 200 miles per hour, the bus can do a 50 miles per hour. So obviously the Ferrari yeah, let's make the math even easier. Let's make the Ferrari do 150 miles per hour and the bus doing 50 miles per hour. So the Ferrari is three times faster than the bus, correct? But the Ferrari can only carry one additional passenger. So the Ferrari would have to take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I'm the driver. Told you. I can use those ponies. So I would have to go back and forth. That's what? 24 trips, because I have to go there 
to drop you off, come back, pick one another next person up, and go there again, right? Hmm. The bus. I'll let anybody drive that, especially in New York City. I'll sit back. One trip. So it would take the Ferrari, believe it or not, eight times longer to transport you guys from Corning to the city versus the Greyhound bus. You cannot ignore these bits. You cannot ignore this word length. In fact, nowadays when you guys are shopping for computers, it's measured as like 32 bits. Or what's the other thing that you're seeing now? 64 bits. Now you're understanding what that's about. Like when you buy Windows, it'll say, is it the 64-bit Windows or the 32-bit Windows? And when you're able to multiply the ward length by the clock speed, by the front side bus, you get that transfer rate that I'm telling you. Now marketing people are like, Americans are horrible at math. Let's give them that universal number. Hence the reason why I'm telling you, I no longer focus on clocks, uh, the front side bus anymore. I call it the transfer rate. It's usually measured in gigabits per second. All right? All it was was the ward length times the clock speed. Now, why do you still need to know about the ward length? Because if you buy a 32-bit operating system and you have all the other power, you're giving yourself a disservice. Oh, let's do some shopping. It's almost like buying a Versace and then walking out with a cheap Timex. You see that if you had that money for a purse or a dress or a pair of shoes, you would think you'd buy yourself a better watch. Because after all, what do you wear more? A watch, correct? So why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we spend a lot of money on something and then little on its counterpart, on its accessory? When they both go hand to hand, if you want to look good, go all out. Don't spend $2,000 or $1,000 on a processor and skimp on the other things because those other things will become your bottleneck. It's like buying a Ferrari in the city. Why waste all that money on that power that you never use when those traffic lights are a bottleneck? In fact, if New York wants to raise some more money or any city that's hurting for money, they should give those people their own private lane. They can go right by every traffic light in town. Would you pay extra for that? Would you imagine on our highways if we give people a private lane that you have to drive 100 miles per hour and you got to stay in that lane, you can't be, be a different school of thought, correct? If you're going to buy that Ferrari and you want to utilize the power, you're going to pay for it, correct? You're going to buy something with a lot of power. Make sure it has more seats in it. You want the best of everything. Does that make sense? Exactly. And all you want to do is stream movies. You got it. Number five. This has been the buzz lately. And with that, I will end this class with why students always find my laundry hilarious. Number of cores. We've been hearing this over and over and over. In fact, in shop for a computer, it's like the i7 uh, or an Intel core processor or something like that. And people are like, what is a core and why does it matter? Obviously, it's going to be a number, right? So the units is just a number. And the more cores, the better off you should be. Let me explain what a core is by understanding the way processing can be done. There's many different ways to process things. I'm going to do this by using my laundry as an example. Anybody do their own laundry in here? Carl, I'll pick on you then. Because 
you know, you and I could probably relate. We're both males, so maybe we do laundry the same way. How often do you do your laundry? Shit, I guess I can't relate to you. I do laundry maybe every, I guess the last time I've done laundry was December. End of December, if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> yeah, it's getting close to doing laundry. And it's safe to say that I don't wear my clothes over during that period of time. All right, so I wear fresh underwear, fresh socks, fresh pants, fresh shirts. So please, if you're in the front row, don't be like, oh gosh, no wonder what smells funny. That's not me at your neighbor. <laughs> All right, now, why do I do laundry? Let's just say I, once a month, so it doesn't look too bad, especially those people on TV land. Um, Versus Carl doing it once a week. Which way do you think is more effective or more efficient? The once a week or the once a month? Now, by the way, it's cost me a lot of, I don't know, years to build up my wardrobe. I think I might have like 80 pairs of underwear. The benefit for being the same size since, you're ninth, since you've been in seventh grade, I guess. I got shirts that say like 1995 on it, and I wear them around, and people are looking at me like, and I'm like, that's right, original. <laughs> but uh, why? Let's look at Carl's approach. We have this washer, and we have this dryer, correct? The dryer can't be working unless it has clothes from the washer, right? Wash clothes must go in the dryer first. So there's this order, there's this process, there's this way of doing things, if you will. First, you gotta dirty up the clothes. Second, you gotta take the dirty clothes and organize them so they're by color or by shape or size, whatever. Point is, you don't put your red clothes with your white clothes. So you gotta organize those. Then you take those organized clothes that are dirty and you put them in your washer machine. In the meantime, what's your dryer doing? Nothing. It's twiddling its thumbs. Washer's done. Carl takes it out, puts it in the dryer. Carl, I have to ask you, do you generate enough clothes in one week to use the washing machine again while the dryer's running? Or do you throw them all in there? I know this is personal. Uh, <laughs> Do you have a girlfriend, by the way? Because if not, I'll, I'll edit this out so that anybody that's out there on the market will know that Carl's not a slob. <laughs> so, what's that? You have enough. So that's good. You're efficient, but maybe not as efficient as somebody does wash every day. And there are people out there who are a little more obsessive than I am. Because if you're doing wash every day, think about the process. Put it in the washing machine, put it in the dryer. Wash machines only be ran once. The dryer's only ran once, ding, it's done. Then you fold it. So there's four steps. Organize, wash, dry, fold, correct? And we call this serial processing. Single task, the task at hand was to wash the clothes. So we say, organize, wash, dry. So the way that would work is I'll go over on the other whiteboard. Hopefully this will follow me over there. And there we go. We break it off here. O for organize. W for wash. D for dry. F for fun. Because that's what it is when you're washing clothes at my house. All right. I got to get a better marker. Could we improve this process? Could we make it faster? Well, back in the day, we called this hyper-threading. And what hyper-threading would allow us to do is if you have, this is only one load, right? But if you have two loads, watch what happens. The organizing can happen, just enough to get the white clothes. Washing happens, then drying. Nothing has changed, correct? But except right here. This is where Cora will say, while the dryer's going, throw another load in, right? So it should have made his washing experience go by a little bit faster. And then this folds, the dryer goes, then you fold again. 
Maybe you can improve this and by moving it all to the end, but your clothes might get wrinkled. So you see how we took this one task of washing clothes, doing laundry, let's call it that, broke it up to four subtasks. We call them threads when it comes to processing. So this would be hyperthreading. All right? So now, how long do you guys think it takes? And by the way, I usually do about 15 loads, 16 loads of clothes. And that's what happens when you generate like a month and a half worth of clothing. Let's assume that this takes about two hours. One hour to wash, give or take, one hour to dry, and then folding. Is that okay, guys? So this method, one hour. This method, because these share times, and these share times, you maybe did two loads in like two hours. Average it out, right? Now, if I said I had 15 loads, how many hours do you think it took me to do my laundry? One load an hour, two hours, two loads, two hours, because I can redo this. Anybody want to take a guess? 15 hours? Doesn't make sense because you get more efficiency. How about seven hours? About half of that? Three hours. Why? And how is that possible? How can you do 15 loads of clothes in three... There you go, and you piss everybody off in the neighborhood because you're taking all the machines up. And that's what this is. Late at night, yeah, I did. Everybody was giving me the evil eye, and I was like, what? <laughs> Just because I came with my pickup truck full of clothes. But time is precious to me. Multiple cores is like having two washers or dryers, like four washers and dryers, and then you can assign each core a task by going to the washer, the laundry machine, or the washer, laundromat, there it is. I have access to a lot of different cores, right? <laughs> you really want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it depends on the size of the laundry machine. Uh, usually about 12, maybe 13, yeah. but less dryers. But, well, you've got to wash them anyway, right? And, and technically, I could argue that because I put more of the clothes in the dryer, that I could probably save a couple of pennies that way. Because you can't get away with using energy. You've got to use it. But I don't own a washer and dryer. Man. And when you're putting all those clothes in there, the wear and tear on it, I'm just like, thank you. <laughs> but, you know, to each is their own. You guys getting the idea of what a core, multi-cores are? You guys have a good weekend. We'll finish this up next Tuesday.